Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, greetings to all of you from New York, the headquarters of the United Nations. Let me also wish you a very enthusiastic 20th anniversary of UN Security Council Resolution 1325. I would begin by thanking wholeheartedly Honorable Mr. M. K. Oded Porat, Chairman of the Knesset Committee on the Status of Women and Gender Equality, for inviting me to address this special event organized by his committee to observe the 1325 anniversary. My very special appreciation goes to the Israeli Civil Society Organization, Itak Maki, for reaching out to me to join this commemorative event for the 20th anniversary. Itak Maki is championing for a decade for the implementation of the 1325 on women and peace and security. In Israel, I had the pleasure of meeting its representatives, Netta and Anat, in New York in 2015, during the 15th anniversary of 1325. It was a pleasure to receive from them the special commemorative advocacy 1325 pin. And I show you that this is the pin that I got from them. And it is now uh, internationally, globally uh, known symbol of 1325. Congratulations. As well, I also received from them the Civil Society Action Plan for Implementation of 1325 in Israel. It is an action-oriented plan and should form the basis of Israel's official national action plan, hopefully in 2021. I am impressed to know that to mark the 20th anniversary of the historic 1325 resolution, Itak Maki has cu curated a virtual series of events to learn, engage, debate, and advance 1325, and to call upon the Israeli government to create a 1325 national action plan. The core message of 1325 is an integral part of my intellectual existence and my humble contribution to a better world for each one of us. A little more than 20 years ago, on the International Women's Day, on the 8th of March in 2000, as the President of the Security Council, following extensive stonewalling and intense resistance from the permanent members, I was able to issue an agreed statement on behalf of all 15 members of the Council with strong support from civil society that formally brought to global attention the contribution women have always been making towards preventing wars and building peace. The Council recognized in that significant norm-setting statement that, and I quote from there, peace is inextricably linked with equality between women and men, end of quote, and also affirmed the value of full and equal participation of women at all decision-making levels. That is when the seed for 1325 was sown. The formal resolution followed this conceptual and political breakthrough on 31st of October of the same year, 2000, with Namibia at the helm of the Council Presidency. After tough negotiations for eight months, from March to October, 
the unexplained silence of the Security Council for 55 years on women's positive role was broken forever on the 8th March 2000. The key focus of 1325 is that women, equal half of humanity, bring a new breadth, a quality, and balance of vision to our common effort to move away from the cult of war towards the culture of peace. Empowered women bring important and different skills and perspectives to the policy-making table in comparison to their male counterpart. Women, women's equality makes our planet safe and secure. The United Nations has recognized time and again that unfortunately overall progress towards gender equality has been unacceptably slow with stagnation and even regression in some areas. Women's rights and equality are under threat from a backlash of conservatism and fundamentalism around the world. UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres said very succinctly that, and I quote him, the truth is that North and South, East and West, I am not speaking about any society, culture, or country in particular. Everywhere we still have a male dominated culture, end of quote. My work has taken me to the farthest corners of the world, and I have seen time and again the centrality of women's equality in our lives. You all know that the Nobel Peace Prize in 2011 was presented to three women peace builders. In its citation, the Nobel Committee referred to 1325 and asserted that, and I quote, we cannot achieve democracy and lasting peace in the world unless women obtain the same opportunities as men to influence developments at all levels of society, end of quote. Patriarchy and misogyny are the dual scourges pulling back the humanity. Men and policies and institutions controlled by them have been the main perpetrators of gender inequality, which is a real threat to human progress. Feminism ensures a smart policy, which is inclusive, uses all potentials and leaves no one behind. I am proud to be a feminist. All of us need to be. That is how we make our planet a better place to live for all. I am asked again and again, what could be done for the true implementation of 1325 to make a difference? In my considered judgment, I have identified four areas of priority for next five years. One, leadership of this UN Secretary General. What role the Secretary General, or we call him SG for short, should play? Secretary General Antonio Guterres has done well, fairly well on women's parity in his senior management team and his policy statements and reports to the Security Council. But many believe there is a need for the Secretary General's genuinely proactive engagement for the effective implementation of 1325. Implementation of 1325 should be seriously taken up by SG's UN system-wide coordination mechanism. A no tolerance 
no impunity approach is a must in cases of sexual exploitation and abuse by UN personnel and its partners in hybrid peacekeeping missions. UN is welcomed in countries for as their protectors. It cannot be become the perpetrators themselves. A 1325 impact statement component with concrete recommendation needs to be included in all reports by the Secretary General to Security Council. Improving the gender architecture in field missions would require Secretary General's engaged leadership to make progress. Number two, national action plans, or NAPs as we call them. As we observe the 20th anniversary, it is truly disappointing that a mere 85 countries out of 193 members of the United Nations have prepared their national action plans for 1325 in 20 years' time. There are no better ways to get country-level commitment to implement 1325 other than the NAPs. Though national action plans are national commitments, it can be globally monitored. Secretary General should also target to get 50 more new NAPs by the 21st anniversary of 1325 next October. Number three, mobilizing men for implementing 1325. We need to recognize that women's equality and their rights are not only women's issues, those are relevant for humanity as a whole. For all of us, we, all of us, women and men, particularly men, should always remember that without peace, development is not possible. Without development, peace is not achievable. But without women, neither peace nor development is conceivable. In this context, I thank Mr. Forer, special initiative to highlight holding of this 1325 event in the Knesset. I would encourage him and all other honorable Knesset members to support the 1325 agenda and the preparation of Israel's official action plan. Four, direct involvement of civil society. Another missing element is a greater, regular, genuine, and participatory involvement of civil society in implementing 1325, both at the national and global levels. The role and contribution of civil society is critical. Civil society should be fully involved in the preparation and implementation of the NAPs at the country levels. Here, I would pay tribute to the organization in Israel, Women Wage Peace for broadening its work for 1325 to become a movement. At the global level, the UN Secretariat should make it a point to consult civil society on a regular basis. Here, I would say for that, the global movement for the culture of peace in New York is making serious efforts. Let me end by reiterating reiterating that if we are serious about peace, we must take women seriously. Thank you very much.